as we look at the, uh, the early church, we're now going to uh, be looking at the organization of the church. And after some thought, I decided I might as well start with me. Uh, so uh, sometimes when I speak the truth about myself, it, uh, it makes it go over a little bit easier when I speak the truth about others. Uh, so we will be looking at the, uh, the biblical teaching uh, on the organization of the church. And so, of course, when we do that, one of the, uh, the first things we want across is the role of the, the preacher. So let me ask you this just for a moment, and we can take a quick spin around the room if people have different ones, but what would you say is the job of the preacher? One thing, Ed, um, one thing. Okay, we're Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be a sin in season out of season. That means all year round. Absolutely. Do we have a representative from the Mobley table? Uh, entertainment. Entertainment. <laughs> yeah. You're only getting a quarter return on your dollar there or something like that? No, no volunteer from the back? Bob? Education? Teaching, yeah. I always say that I I like uh, the uh, the passage in the Old Testament where it talks about the fact that they uh, they read the word and then they gave the the meaning of the word to the people. Uh, so I think that's a good one. Don't even have that one in there. That's just a bonus. Anybody else? You did, you already spoke. I, I know. <laughs> um, so it is correct. I mean that, that is the essence of it. But the expectation of the foundation uh, of the preacher is completely different. I shouldn't say completely different, but greatly expanded mm -hmm. from that basic expectation. And and why do you think that would be? How does that happen? We pay okay. So one one thing is we we put off responsibilities uh, that the Bible teaches as our own with the fact that we pay someone to do that, just like we pay someone to maybe cut the grass. You know. Uh, so yes, it's my responsibility to keep the lawn up, but I pay someone to do that. Yeah. There's one more thing even greater than what I said earlier. God ordains the preaching because he says through the foolishness of the gospel preaches the word to get out there. Yeah. Mine? And whether we like it or not, it, it's the way it is. People will look at the preacher as he is, quote, more holier than me, unquote. Ah, I think I got that in here. All right, well, we're going to start with what will obviously be a little tongue-in-cheek to play to some of these expectations, but this is the uh, perfect preacher. And in my defense, let me say first off that I didn't create this list, but uh, I do find it fairly accurate. Uh, so first off, uh, he preaches 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's get that guy out of there. Yeah, we might learn something, and we don't want that. Uh, he, he condemns sin, but he does it in such a way that he never offends anyone. You, you think about that one for a minute. But that is, that is the reality. We know he's supposed to condemn sin, but boy, if he offends anyone, we're upset with him. Uh, he works from 8 a.m. till midnight, including janitorial work. Uh, so he makes six and this is my favorite he makes six hundred dollars per week he wears good clothes he buys good books he drives a good car and he gives five hundred dollars per week to the poor <laughs> and then he's 28 years old and he's been preaching for 30 years <laughs> so you got a lot of experience but you got that used and energy again 
Uh, at least we find one that I fit. He is wonderfully, perfectly handsome. Uh, we don't want an ugly creature. Uh, he has a burning desire. We have to talk to his wife. <laughs> he has a burning desire. And don't think I wasn't thrilled that she came in here this morning when I was talk talking about me because hey. Uh, but he has a burning desire to work with uh, the young people, but spends all his time with the older folk. He smiles with a straight face because his sense of humor keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. And let's see. And he makes 15 calls per day on church family, shut-ins, hospitalized, while evangelizing, evangelizing the lost. So, again, kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, but touching on the difference between expectations and what the Bible actually teaches. So, as always, our concern is, what does the Bible teach? Uh, and I've got this in three sections. I think we can cover two sections this morning, so we'll see. Uh, so, let's start with the work itself. Uh, this, of course, is 2 Timothy 4, 5. There are numerous, more than numerous, there are a great number of scriptures in the New Testament that talk about preaching. And you can read the entire books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. You can read uh, the, all the outstanding examples in Acts. Uh, so we're not touching on everything and a lot of times when there is a passage where I would like to see the whole passage uh, we may just be picking a verse out of it but, but if you really want to dig into these things there's where you need to go so this is 2 Timothy 4 and, and verse 5 but you be sober in all things endure hardship do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry and we'll break some down these words a little bit uh, a, a little bit later in the lesson but uh, what stands out to you about those instructions remember that's Paul writing to uh, the younger Timothy there endure hardship that certainly that's one of the ones that catches my eye It's difficult, and believe me, when you're going through it, it's more difficult. Uh, but it's a fact. And I do tell the uh, uh, young men when they talk to me about their ministries or about going in ministry and everything, that you do have to expect some hardship and understand that it's not that the hardship is just but it's that that is part of the price you pay to be a preacher. And I know, I've been there too, you know, sometimes uh, that price is just too high. But you have to always understand that that is part of the deal. I know going in to any ministry any, with any congregation that I'm not going to make everybody happy. And what's more, I know that the ones I generally make happy are occasionally not going to be happy with me. Uh, I'm going to touch on something that, that hits them in some way, and they're not. But to see how far apart we are from expectations and what the Bible teaches the actual work is, you know, my job is to remind you of what is lacking in your discipleship. That just sounds like a great job, right? Everybody would love that guy, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that, that is the job. So it's going to bring you some hardship. Uh, but if you don't endure it, you can't fulfill your ministry. Enduring hardship, we don't always mention it. But your wife and kids oh, have, yes. to, have to suffer more than you realize because of the expectation of both your wife and your kids. I heard of a congregation where the ladies, some of the ladies in the congregation, went to the preacher's wife, played, 
walked into their house, they checked out her wardrobe and said, you can wear this, you can't wear that, you can wear this, you can't wear that. So they're told, they were told what the, what the wife could wear at worship. Well, I hope the preacher and his wife then went into their household. <laughs> but, yes, the, the cost to the family is honestly usually the greatest cost. Yes. Uh, and maybe we'll talk some more about that later, but let's, uh, let's move on for now. Uh, so the preacher was not only to teach that this is from Augustine. Augustine, if you look at preaching historically, which is part of this class is what I've done is look at the, the first few centuries uh, of preaching, uh, as well as some of the things about the what the Reformation brought into preaching that we've talked about in the past. We're going further back now to, to these first few centuries. Uh, Augustine wrote what is generally considered to be the first book on preaching, about how to preach. And so homiletics is basically the science or the how-to of preaching. Uh, so... He wrote in, uh, in his book, which was called Christian Doctrine, the preacher was not only to teach that he may instruct and to please that he may hold attention. Now, I'm going to pause it right there for a minute. This is one of those aspects of teaching uh, of, and preaching that's missed. But to be effective... You have to be able to present the message in some, such a way that it holds their attention. Uh, I may have told y'all the one about uh, the young mechanic at the church who decided he had a call to preach. And he told his elders and they, they let him preach a couple of times and he couldn't keep anybody's attention. And yet he was just insistent that he was going to take his young family uh, and, and go into to full-time preaching. And so one of the elders decided to go visit him at his job and, and talk to him about, you know, whether that was really the, the right decision for him or whether he might could serve in some other way. And the young man finally said, you, you just don't seem to understand. I, I feel the call to preach. And the elder said, you just don't seem to understand. No one feels the call to listen. Uh, and there, there is a, a, some truth into that. And that's what Augustine is talking about in this section, about the responsibility. I know a lot of people uh, with a, a great deal of knowledge, which is what we are going to see as the basis. Uh, but to be effective, you've got to be able to hold people's attention when you do it. So the preacher was not only to teach that he may instruct and to please that he may hold attention, but also to persuade that he might be victorious. Just passing the knowledge along is not enough. And this is another part of the built-in friction between the preacher and the congregation. Because if I just had to pass the knowledge along, it would be a lot easier. But after I pass the knowledge along, I need to provoke you. I need to get you to make application to yourself instead of just having learned a fact, you see. Uh, and that's a far, far different thing. Uh, he goes on to say, let a preacher's diction be poor, and his style simple and unornamented, but let him not be unskilled in the knowledge and accurate explanation of doctrine. So in other words, yes, I've said these things and these things are important, but, you know, he could be less uh, talented at holding attention, etc. He can't be less talented about knowing the Word of God. And when we wonder how the church is where it's at today, all we have to do is look at what we've done to our preachers. Some of it's on the fault of the preacher, some of it's on the fault of the congregation, but 
The bottom line is people today in an average congregation prefer a, a teacher, a preacher who is a good speaker and, and can be entertaining. Everything. And they worry about that much more than they worry about what his knowledge level of the Word of God is. And that is backwards, and that's what Augustine's trying to say here. That is backwards. The, the core thing, as we're going to see, the preacher is God's messenger. If he doesn't know the message, he cannot be the messenger. But he's going to be somebody's messenger. So he's up there teaching and pleasing ears and everything. Uh, but he's not serving God's will. But everyone feels good because they think they did. And that is an extremely perilous situation for our souls. So these are the three basic terms used in the New Testament uh, for the preacher. The first one is minister, the second one is preacher, and the third one is evangelist. Karen? Oh yes. Uh, again, it's about communication. I used to tell my secretary, Lance, back when I used to write an article every week. But I used to tell the secretary, I said, if you go, if you proofread my article and there's one word in there that you don't know or that you don't feel like the average person knows, that's okay. I like to teach one word a week. <laughs> I said, if there's two in there, you need to point it out to me. If it's three, don't, don't print it. <laughs> uh, because we're definitely not rolling with a, an article, a lesson that has three words in it that people don't know. Uh, as I said, I, I like for one or sometimes even two uh, uh, to be utilized as long as the context is giving the clue. Uh, but if you're up there and you're just tossing words about, I had a guy call the other day. It was an, an escalation, so he's calling to complain about something, you know. So he gets to me, and we have a long conversation. But early on, I notice he is deliberately throwing all these large words in there. He really wants to impress me with who he is and everything. And I keep responding and and in kind and finally after about a 20 minute conversation he said well I appreciate you you listening to me and, and for you being so erudite and I thought yeah you, you, you didn't know when you decided to play this game that you were playing with a PhD and, and what, <laughs> what could work out your way but it's funny how people are because a lot of people will do that with me they will, they will get you as a supervisor and they will try and impress you with who they are and their importance and so they will start using big words. It's really funny when they use ones they don't know the meaning, huh? But that happens too. All right, Monty, you're here for the Greek. <laughs> I'm going to let Monty pronounce this one for you for evangelist. You like the mixtape. Exactly like that. Uh, that is the word we get evangelist from, and it basically means a messenger who brings good news. So, and remember, while we have uh, made these words specific to religion, the words originally are simply words that are part of their normal language. So, when the early Christians are using that word evangelist, uh, the connotation to people that hear is that it's a messenger who's bringing good news. Uh, so 2 Timothy 4, 5 uh, that we looked at earlier, do the work of an evangelist. So part of my job very clearly is to do what? Bring good news. You ever know a preacher that can only seem to preach bad news? 
know? Yeah. Those guys are great. But are they speaking the truth? No, they're not. No, they're not, because your message is a message of hope. That's what it's all about. Uh, so, well, you might have to preach a rebuking sermon, as we'll talk about, you know, at, at some point. If that's all you do, or all you do is doom and gloom preaching, then uh, you're doing a disservice both to God and your audience. So, uh, Then we have preacher. I'll try this one, Mom. We think it's Kurux. It's something very close to that. Uh, but uh, that simply meant, that's the word that's usually translated preacher. And it meant a, a herald, a messenger who was vested with public authority. So you think of like the king or the governor's uh, messengers that went out. Somebody like that. And why is that a good understanding for us to have? Whose message are we bringing? God's. You know. uh, it's one of the things you actually, both whether you're quote unquote a preacher <laughs> or a Christian, any Christian, you really need to work on viewing yourself in this life. It would change so much if all of us would start viewing ourselves, not necessarily as preachers, but as messengers of God, messengers of the King. Eddie? Now, uh, just to get a laugh, so this is what the Jehovah Witnesses are doing? What? They're the, they're the herald, they're the messengers, and when they knock on your door, and, 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 and once again, you got to test the spirit. So you, you, you put them to the test. Absolutely. Yeah. Start asking them about how the Bible fits mm -hmm. with what uh, they teach. And they'll tell you it fits great. And as soon as you start actually looking at verses, they're out of there. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, let me go to Nona first. Are, are we not all evangelists? Yes, that's yeah. why I said. We need to all view ourselves in yeah. that line. Paul's talking about himself there. He was going to That's what the second time we're here or alone. Oh, yes. But, again, he wrote it to Timothy as the leader of the church and Titus as the leader of that church and preacher there. So it is for all of us. And that is the point I was trying to make, is that if we all could view ourselves in that line, I mean, that's... We should. To me, that's a simple thing. Now, I know that in practice it hasn't worked out that way. But that is a big part of recognizing what God does for you and, and what being a disciple of Christ does for you. There is an elevated status to that. It's not a holier-than-thou status, but it is an honorable position Paul also speaks about being ambassadors for Christ. And while he may have been applying the phrase there just to the apostles, that's a, a debatable position there, the principle is true for all of us. We're, we're heralds of God. We're ambassadors for Christ. And if we could just change the way we look at our lives to that mindset, you know, uh, do you think those guys had to be careful about their reputation? Mine? Yeah, uh, Chris, you know, if we start to view ourselves and, and remember that we are the ecclesia, we are the call out to begin with, and a herald was one who was sent out. And so you can notice that I was appointed a guy to be sent out. So maybe we just look at ourselves as this is God's appointment for me is to be sent out and to be that holy priesthood. Right. It, see, make a big difference. it would help us with our struggles with self-esteem and everything to understand that 
you are important and you are important to God and you are important to the work of God. Fine. Yes. Right. I think it would be an interesting experiment to go around and introduce ourselves to our friends and co-workers and uh, shopkeepers and whoever when they ask us, who are you? Well, I'm a preacher. And, and see the reaction and the change. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have been on a golf course. And you know, you, you frequently play with strangers on the golf course. And I try and, and live and let live to a great degree on the golf course. I know they're not out there to hear a sermon, you know, anything like that. But if we play three holes and, and you're, you're up to double digits and swear words, I'm not going to rebuke you. I don't think I've ever rebuked the person for doing that. What I've always done is before the next shot, inform them that I was a preacher. And I have got, one poor guy was just about to fall on his knees. He was like, oh, sorry. I was like no, it's fine, but you know, I would appreciate it. Uh, but that would be great, and uh, we'll have a sign-up sheet in the back. Bob will man it. Everybody wants to volunteer for that project, and let Bob know, and you can report back to the class. And now this is the one where we can have men and women. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we're all heralds of God. All right, so a messenger vested with public authority. And, and that appointed carries that thought uh, of vested. Uh, I do like the way he says, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. Uh, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Uh, here is Haggai uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with, with the Lord's message. See how much sense that makes? That the messenger of the Lord would then speak the Lord's message. Uh, and then there is minister. And this one will help us in a couple ways. Now, uh, when you had a class, I guess you were probably teaching Timothy and Titus at the time, or just surveying them. Uh, but I know we talked a good bit about diaconus uh, in that class. So diaconos is simply servant and so anyone can be diaconous everyone did i miss anybody lance should i take you into everybody should be a diaconus that is the heart of discipleship is to be a servant and so you shouldn't be a christian and not be diaconus. Now there is an office that we'll talk about later that uh, we, we term deacon that has a list of qualifications. That word is used because they're special servants, but because they're special servants, there are those qualifications, and that is not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the office of, we're talking about the, the practice of being a servant, being a minister. Now, uh, better get my Bible out, Twain. I, I may forget my passage. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to Acts 6. And if you recognize that chapter, you might recall that that is the appointment of the seven. Uh, that takes place there. That, that is actually not the part I'm looking for exactly. So you remember it starts with the trouble with the Grecian widows not getting uh, fair treatment and their complaint. And so the apostles said, verse 3, or verse 2, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And that word served there is diaconus. Uh, 
So I point that out because it it is important to understand what we have done with this aspect of preaching is means that guy needs to do everything for us, and if I you know get a hangnail, he needs to be there, and uh, he needs to take my splinter out, and he needs to to do all those things that we talked about in the opening. He can do all those things. He should look for opportunity to to do all those things. But the the preacher, the minister, does have that primary ministry of serving in the word. I'm your special servant in the word. And again, we have totally lost that perspective. Uh, but that is what the apostles are saying there. Now, up until then, the apostles had been taking care of the distribution. How do you think Sister Mary felt when Peter quit being the one bringing around the food to her? <laughs> Yeah, she, you know, well, Peter, Peter used to do this. Why is he too good for this? Uh, am I not? That, that, doesn't God love me too? And, you see, it's that easy to mix up priorities, and the preacher's priority has got to be to be biblical, to be the message. And that is something that people don't want to hear at all these days. Yes, he should be the servant. I have the same obligation to be that diakonos that all of you do. I don't have less of one. You see what I'm saying? But I don't have more of one either. Because my primary service is in the Word. Eddie? Um, people sometimes forget that you're human and, uh, and preachers are not perfect. What? And, and if you make a mistake, or if you sin or whatever, they say, oh, God forbid, you be a preacher. He, he, he was human first. Yeah. Right. So he has to deal with that, or that person has to deal with that, with God and with the congregation. And, and, it, and it's our job to forgive. Yeah. And uh, as I've said many times, without the uh, grace and forgiveness amongst ourselves, <laughs> Uh, we won't accomplish anything for the Lord. Yeah, they'll crucify you. And we've missed, we've missed that basic lesson. So, uh, uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, he's talking about the need to teach proper doctrine regarding behavior. And uh, in, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Do you see that constantly nourished part? The preacher who quit studying, that congregation is in trouble. And that goes on a lot more than you might think. Uh, but I need that constant nourishment. I can't, I can't be your preacher. Uh, I can't be a good disciple without that constant nourishment. Uh, and so, all right, well, we have hit the red. Uh, man, we were almost through with that section. Oh, well, Lord willing, we will pick that up next week. Class dismissed.